decade of darkness, a phrase that aptly describes the years 2005 to 2015 for the Toronto Maple Leafs franchise. A decade where the Maple Leafs would trade Tuka Rask for Andrew Raycroft. One, a future Hall of Fame goaltender, and the other, an analyst for Nesson. A decade where GM Cliff Fletcher would mistake Jeff Finger for a better defenseman and sign him to a $14 million contract. A decade filled with hot dogs, horrible contracts, and collapses of both variety. 4-1 and 18-wheeler. It was a bleak time. Leaf fans had nothing. No hope. No optimism for the future. Just paper bags to put on our heads. All was lost in Leafland, it seemed. That was until the day Brendan Shanahan joined the team and introduced the Shanna plan. A plan devised to get the Maple Leafs organization back on track by drafting and developing players based on skill and not size alone. This started with the Leafs drafting William Nylander 8th overall in the 2014 NHL Draft, then Mitch Marner the year after at 4th overall. Now Mitch Marner and William Nylander were exciting pits, but nothing would compare to the players the Leafs would draft in 2016. After the Leafs finished dead last in 2015-2016 season, they were awarded with the first overall pick in the 2016 NHL Entry Draft. They used this first overall selection to pick Austin fucking Matthews, a player of immense skill and even larger nostrils. With their three new stars and free agent superstar John Tavares joining the team in 2018, the Leafs looked to be a perennial contender for years to come and on the cusp of their first Stanley Cup in over 50 years. So what happened? It's 2020. Why aren't the Leafs drowning in Stanley Cups? Well, things didn't work out as most Leafs fans hoped they would. And with the team not even technically making the playoffs in 2020, darkness is once again sweeping over Leafland. We are Putt Prophecies, and this is 5 Reasons Why the Leafs Went From Contender to Pretender. Number 5 After the 2018-2019 season, the Leafs needed to change. They had once again got absolutely embarrassed by the Bruins in Game 7, and were still looking for their first playoff round in the last 15 fucking years. Many people laid the blame on one man, Nazem Kadri. Fans thought Kadri was selfish as he got himself suspended for the series when he tried to decapitate yet another Bruin player. This is why last summer the news of him being traded was cause for celebration in Leaf Nation. Sure, they were giving up one of the most cap-friendly deals on the team, a guy who gave them some grit and a shutdown option against other teams' top lines, but Kadri bad. And just look at that return. The Leafs got Tyson Berry and Alex Kerfoot for that lousy bag of pucks? (laughs) Bye, Felicia. Well, one year later, and Kadri, still on his team-friendly contract of 4.5 mil a year, has 36 points in 51 games as an avalanche. That's good for .7 points per game. Meanwhile, Kerfoot and Berry combined have 67 points in 135 games. That's less than half a point per game combined. And Berry is walking this summer. Oh, and to top things off, Kadri won his first playoff series while the Leafs technically missed the playoffs. Ouch. Number four. Some say that a good right-handed defenseman is like a unicorn. And you know what? As a Leafs fan, I fucking believe it. Because I've never seen one with my own eyes. I mean, I've seen one, just not one that plays for the Leafs. 
The lack of good right-handed defensemen on the Leafs in this past decade is honestly shocking. Here is a list of players that have played on Morgan Riley's right side on the top pairing since he's entered the league. Dion Phaneuf, Cody Franzen, Roman Polak, Matt Hunwick, Nikita Zaitsev, and 38-year-old Ron Hainsey. Pylon, 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 pylon. And this year, he played with King Pylon himself, Cody fucking CeCe. A defensive defenseman who can't play D. He can't do offense, can't do defense, so it begs the question, what exactly do you do here? A lack of quality defensemen is a major reason why the Leafs struggled in 2020 and haven't been able to make it past the first round in the last four years. But honestly, if you look at their left side, the situation doesn't seem so dire. On the left this year, they had Morgan Riley, Jake Muzzin, and Travis Dermott. Pretty good, right? But then you look at their right side. Cody CC, Justin Hall, and Tyson Berry. And I know what you're thinking. Tyson Berry's pretty good. He had multiple 50-point seasons in Colorado. And to that... I say, but that's all he does. He's basically a fourth forward. He has no idea how to play actual defense. And he has the defensive coverage of a Timbits hockey team. He'll do one 360 spinorama a game and then proceed to shoot point shots into forward shin pads for the rest of it. The Leafs were bottom five in the league this year in goals against, despite being in a playoff spot when the season ended. For a team with this much talent and a goaltender as solid as Frederick Anderson, that's horrifying. If the Leafs acquired a top pairing right-handed D-man at any point since the 2016-2017 season, things may have been different. They may have actually been able to advance past the first round. But this was not the case. They do have two promising deep prospects in the system right now with Timothy Lilligren and Rasmus Sandin, but who knows if they will live up to their potential. Either way you look at it, the Leafs have a deep problem and it has cost them dearly. Number 3 In today's NHL, we are constantly seeing the shift away from having a bona fide number one. The 1A, 1B tandem system has proven its success. In the last four years, only one cup-winning tendy has had more than 50 regular season starts. The fact is, being an NHL goalie is hard work. You're constantly getting hit with frozen rubber traveling at ridiculously high speeds, you have fully grown men smashing into you, and you need to have the flexibility of an Olympic fucking gymnast. I pulled my groin just looking at that shit. It's not like you can just drive a Zamboni for a living, throw on some pads and win an NHL game. Freddie Anderson has at least 60 starts in each of his past three seasons, getting absolutely shelled by the opposition as his team refuses to play defense. When Dubas arrived on scene, his first decision was to address the situation. He made the call of releasing McElhaney, a proven journeyman backup who had done a serviceable job there the year before, and instead went with Garrett Sparks, a completely unproven rookie who played for him in the AHL. Sparks would, of course, go on to completely shit the bed, going 8-9 with a 902 save percentage and a 3.15 goals against average. Including Sparks, Freddy's had four backups over the last two years since that decision. Combined, they are 15-19-2 with an 886 save percentage and a 3.86 goals against average. Meanwhile, in those two years, McElhaney has a 28-18-5 record with a 909 save percentage and a 2.74 goals against average. Whoops. Number two. The Toronto Maple Leafs are a lot of things. Skilled, high scoring, fast, and soft as baby shit. They are a team built on puck possession and offensive chances. Unfortunately, that doesn't translate to the playoffs so well. Just look at those numbers. Columbus and the Leafs are literal opposites in goals for and against categories. The fact of the matter is the Leafs have no pushback in this series. This year it took a 37-year-old man to try to defend them against a blue jacket ass whooping. 
Defense wins championships. Defense definitely wins first rounds. Over the last five years, the lowest the champion has been is 17th in goals against the season that they won. Three of the last five champions were in the top six in goals against the year they won. The Leafs? They've been worse than half the league in four of the last five years in goals against. Basically, the Leafs are a team based on the idea that hockey should be fun. And in some ways, they're right. But you know what's more fun? Winning. They haven't had that kind of fun in over 50 fucking years. Number one. The RFA contract tots. Oh boy. This is a spicy one. Before these tots started, Leafs fans loved their three new superstars. They were smitten with the stupid sexiness of William Nylander. Loved Mitch Marner's childlike wonder and couldn't get enough of Austin Matthews' dirt nasty wrist shot. However, this unconditional love came to an end for many Leafs fans when each one of these players raked Kyle Dubas over the coals and sucked every penny they could from the Maple Leaf franchise. It all started with William Nylander. William Nylander was signed on December 1st of the 2018-2019 season. Almost two full months after the season started, and on the last possible day to sign before he had to sit out the season. He was signed for six years at almost 7 mil a season. Now, this was a fair deal, all things considered. The problem was how long it took. Since he was signed so late in the season, Nylander missed training camp and the first two months of the season. This had a horrendous effect on his 2018-2019 season, where he only scored 27 points and 54 games. Compare this to his season this year, where he had 59 points and 68 games. The late contract obviously had an effect, and it had an effect on the two remaining RFAs as well. They realized that Kyle Dubas would collapse like a house of cards when it came down to it in these contract talks. And you know what? They took advantage of it. The next star fay that was signed was Matthews. I don't have much to say about this contract, only that the term takes him right into unrestricted free agency, and if he leaves the team for more money, this fan base will implode and rip a hole in space-time, causing the heat death of the entire universe. The last RFA that was signed was Mitch Marner. He was signed for six years at basically 11 million, which is 2 million too much if you ask me. And I love this player. I have a signed Marner jersey in my closet for fuck's sakes. The whole situation around this contract was strange. Darren Ferris, Marner's agent, threatened that Marner would play in Europe if he wasn't signed. Which not a single person in the world believed. And Darren Drager, TSN insider, seemingly went off the deep end and started tweeting crazy shit about Marner's camp. Also, Marner's dad was super pissed at the Leafs for something that happened in his rookie season. It was just weird. Once this was all over, the Leafs had almost 30 million wrapped up in three players, which left about 50 million to sign everyone else on the team. This severely harmed their ability to surround this core with a good supporting cast, and a main reason why players like Michael can't stop a beach ball Hutchison were on the team this year. Thank you.